Hello and welcome to Module 8, the Six Sigma Approach. Today we will talk about Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, or FMEA. Failure Modes and Effects Analysis is a tool used to quantify and prioritize risk within a process, product, or system, and then track actions to mitigate the risk. It's essentially a risk management tool. It was first developed in the 1950s and then gained high use in, by NASA in the 1960s. From there, it became wider spread into the automotive industry and now is widely used across all organizations today. Ultimately, what we're looking at today will look very similar to what was originally developed within the 1950s and has gone through very few modifications in that time. Within FMEAs, there are different types. There are systems, designs, or process FMEAs, depending on the nature of the need. So first question is, why use an FMEA? Most importantly, it focuses on prevention rather than firefighting because it identifies risk. It also prioritizes the risk of potential failures associated with the process. It will allow for the proactive development of process controls to address those issues before they occur and also mitigates the anxiety associated with the concern of the unknown from product, process, or system changes. This is an important one for a systems engineer to truly understand how this tool can be leveraged. When creating a system or improving a process, there's often anxiety from other business stakeholders about whether something is going to work that has never been done before. FMEA tool can not only address whether those issues are valid or not, it can also suggest whether or not action should be taken. So who and when? Who constructs the FMEA? It can be done by the Six Sigma project team, since we're talking about Six Sigma in this particular case, but it can also be done by a systems engineer, design engineer, or process owner. One thing to consider is that while a systems engineer, design engineer, or process owner could be managing and maintaining the process for creating the FMEA. It should be used leveraging multiple stakeholders and subject matter experts in order to truly be effective. When it should be conducted, constructed depends on the particular need. For project, process, or system changes, it's typically most effective if it's done before implementation. In Six Sigma, this is usually during the improve and control phase in which case you would create it in the approved phase to assess your risk and then show your risk mitigation actions as part of your sustainment planning. In the FMEA itself, there are two main components. The first is the risk assessment and the second is the implementation plan. The risk assessment begins and identifies the potential failure modes and the risk associated with their effects. The implementation plan is where you detail steps to address the top risks and then recalculate the after correct actions have been put in place. So in creating an FMEA, there's several steps to follow. The first is to brainstorm and group all potential failure modes. It's important to brainstorm any way that the product, process, or system could fail. And this can be a very exhausting effort, but it's very valuable to get these all done up front before you go and evaluate them individually. You then go to list all the potential effects for each failure mode. So for example, if it were to if fail in this particular way, what would happen and what would be the result? From there, you then assess the risk. What is the severity of the failure? If, how, if it does occur, how significant and severe is it? Then, likelihood of occurrence. How realistic is a possibility that this could happen? And then the risk of failing to detect. So how likely is it that if it's going to fail, will we catch it before it impacts our final customer? For there, you calculate the risk priority number for each effect and use these risk priority numbers to select the highest priority failure modes and develop a plan to address. At that point, you would then go carry out those action plans, reassess risk, and continue this cycle of going back to step five and carrying on until the risk is acceptable to move on. So looking at the process terminology within the FMEA, process description includes three elements. So the process element, which is the process steps where the failure or problem would occur, the failure mode, the way that a process step could go wrong, and the failure effect, which is the impact on the key customer or business requirements. The risk has severity, so how significant the impact of the failure, the occurrence, how frequent the failure occurs, and detection is how likely the failure would not be identified prior to impacting the customer. And then your process assessment has both potential causes and current controls the potential causes being the factors within the process that enable the defect to occur, and the controls being existing methods to prevent or detect the error, good, bad, or indifferent, what is in place currently. 
within each of these ratings in order to evaluate your likelihood of occurrence, uh, detectability risk, and severity risk, you have to have a rating scale. And this is typically done on a 1 to 10 scale basis. And this here is an example of what a rating scale might look like. For example, from a severity perspective, a 10 out of 10 would be the worst and most severe possible failure. This would be a substantial impact to cost, quality, or customer experience, and a potential consumer safety issue. Going on down all the way to 1 is the least severe. This would be a negligible impact to cost, quality, or customer service, and the customer is unlikely to notice or be concerned. From there, you'll notice that some of those factors don't have number in place. So you don't have the option to put a 2, a 4, a 6, 7, or 9. That is very common, and you don't always need to differentiate all the way from 1 to 10, as long as there's good separation in between. Occurrence goes everywhere from once a day to less than once per year. And detectability, a 10 out of 10 would be the defect is highly unlikely to be detected anywhere other than the customer, meaning you have a very high detection risk. A low detectability risk would be is highly likely of being detected at the source of the error. So yes, whether or not this occurs, how severe or not it may be, but the reality is if it occurs, we're going to catch it and it's not going to impact our customer. The risk priority number is the number that assesses the risk by taking those components of severity, occurrence, and detection. It essentially multiplies the factors for each of those three and combines it into one number to boil them all together. The largest RPN values will indicate the most significant areas of risk, and a general guideline for prioritizing actions is that the highest priority items should be anything over 200. 100 to 199 is typically your second priority, and then your third and fourth priorities are 26 to 100 or 1 to 25. Typically speaking, 1 to 25 is extremely low risk and usually does not require significant effort. 1 over 200 is almost always considered exceptionally high risk and cannot go forward without taking some sort of mitigating circumstances to reduce that level of risk. One of the main shortcomings of the RPN number is that the RPN is essentially just a guideline and must be combined with common sense, intuition, and logic. In fact, when you're assessing this risk, you may not have data to be able to quantify how likely the occurrence is or how likely the detection or severity is because you have not implemented the system and you never and you don't have any way to measure or evaluate it. In those cases, you might have to use best available data, judgment, or intuition. In that case, you have to realize that the number itself can be a little bit arbitrary and is more directional than finite. This, take this particular example where you have two RPNs that are rated 160 and 200. Logically speaking, they're both failure modes require action, but mode A requires immediate action because of the liability because it has a severe 10 out of 10 potential consumer safety issue. That being the case, it still has a lower than 100, lower RPN of 160 versus 200. When you're looking at this in a real world scenario, you should evaluate and say these are very high, but just because this is the case, are there any in there that are a little bit lower that you still need to prioritize? Again, you have to look at this directionally. The other thing to consider is ease of implementation. As you're discussing these, uh, you're going through and conducting this evaluation, there are some that you will realize will be extremely easy to fix and address, and some things that will be very painful and very difficult. If there's something that is relatively easy to mitigate, even if it's a lower uh, on the priority list, it's still a good practice to do. Some things might be a little higher than you would like, but are very difficult to fix. In that case, you might have to consider whether that's an acceptable risk, and you take that as an acceptable risk by communicating that to your champion and your stakeholders and saying, this is, unfortunately, we'd like to have this better, but we are taking this risk as it is, and that's an acceptable business decision. Here's an example of a risk assessment process step here would be putting coffee in the filter. If you were to brainstorm potential failure modes, you could say if putting, you could put decaf in the regular, you could add too much coffee or don't add enough coffee. If we spend enough time in it, I'm sure we could figure out many other ways the key input could go wrong, but for illustration purposes, we'll pick just these three. So then for each of those, look and say what are the impact of the key customer business requirements. If you put decaf in the regular, the customer does not get the caffeine in the coffee, and they would assess that a severity of 8 out of 10. Potential cause could be that what is the key var input variables go wrong. If it's all the coffee is stored together or several pots of coffee are made at the same time, those are potential causes in there and your likelihood of occurrence is much higher in the, for the second one. And then current controls, 
The coffee comes in black bags, decaf comes in bright red. It puts a detection risk, a likelihood detected of five. In those cases there, those would give RPN values of 120 and 240. Going down a little bit further, to add too much coffee, the customer thinks it's stronger or weaker than it's expected. They have, it's, it certainly is less severe than the customer not getting caffeine, which is the point of why they're purchasing the coffee. The likelihood of occurrence is significantly lower, and the likelihood of detecting it, even if it does happen, is also much lower. There's, the risk of detection is much lower. For that case here, the bottom two have much lower RPNs of 30 and 10. The next step would then be to take into the implementation plan. Since the top two were the highest two and the bottom two were relatively low risk, the top two were the only two that were determined to need to take actions on them. The implementation plan details the necessary process changes and accountabilities to reduce the risk. So for example, in this case here, they say they want to store the regular and decaf in separate areas and label the areas for the flavored coffee storage. You'll notice in there that they then look and say who is responsible, what is the target completion date, and then once it's complete, they reassess the severity, occurrence, and detection risk. The severity didn't change. However, the likelihood of occurrence goes down substantially and now is at a 1 and takes the 25 value as an RPN. This is an example of completing it and showing what the risk should be reassessed after the implementation of those corrective actions.